Dr. Lynn Kohick is a New Testament professor at Wheaton, and she is our first female speaker. And we do not have her here because she is a female speaker, and I cannot wait to hear from her. I give you Dr. Lynn Kohick. Here we go. Thank you very much um, for inviting me to join the uh, Lanier Theological Library in its efforts to dig deeply into the world of the Bible. I'm very grateful for the hospitality Mark and Becky, Charles and Jenny have extended to me, the entire staff. So I look forward to thinking with scripture, uh, through scripture with you tonight. My family lived in rural Kenya for three years in the late 1990s. During that time, 23-year-old um, Paul Jiroge worked for us in our house. He was cooking, cleaning, washing, and being a big brother to our younger children, to our young children. At one point, he asked if we would be interested in helping his family with a celebration. He wanted us to help honor his younger brother who, at age 15, was undergoing circumcision. Paul told me about his own circumcision done a few years earlier. The procedure was done in his rural home, and uh, you can see we're standing out in front of, of his house in this photo. Um, and he said he recuperated quietly for about three weeks. This family made special food for him and treated him uh, very nicely. Well, I asked Paul, I said, what did the practice of circumcision mean to him? And he said it was a doorway to adulthood, to manhood. Well, I pushed a little bit further. I said, well, who would know whether you're circumcised? I mean, after all, I thought, there's no, like, nude beaches around, and there was no uh, sports centers with public showers. But his simple answer was profound. He said, I would know. I would know. If we transpose that answer to the key of Philippians, we might catch the note that Paul scribes here. We are the circumcision, Paul says to the Philippian believers, but these Gentile men in the group would not be physically marked in this way. Well, on the one hand, it may seem as if the two Pauls offer different and unrelated examples of circumcision. So my Kenyan friend speaks of the physical, of the flesh, rite of passage, while the Apostle Paul will designate circumcision as a religious identity that's explicitly not done on the body. But on the other hand, both Pauls emphasize the radical, life-changing effect of being a circumcised, circumscribed, <laughs> circumcised one. They both highlight how circumcision changed their identity. For Droge, the knowledge that he underwent the, this rite of passage to adulthood or manhood made all the difference in his public demeanor. He was a man now. He had standing in the community. In a similar sense, the apostle insists that believers have a new identity based on a real spiritual change such that now one worships in the spirit of God. Well, I'd like to explore Christian identity as it plays out in Philippians 3, developing this metaphor, we are the circumcision. My argument has several layers. At the historical level, I hope to show that the Judaism in Paul's day was not based on works righteousness. That is, Jews in Paul's day did not think they needed to earn their salvation. At a socio-cultural level, I hope to show that Paul focused on bringing together Jews and Gentiles as united in Christ and for Christ. This means that at the theological level, Paul must address the question of what a holy community looks like. And this involves a decision about the necessity of circumcision. And then finally, at the political level, I hope to show how Paul reshapes the political parlance of his day, challenging conventional expectations and drawing new pictures of community goals and community loyalty. With Paul's claim, we are the circumcision, 
Paul captains the Christian ship safely between two dangers. To use the language familiar in Paul's day from Homer's Odyssey, Paul must sail between the skilla of mandating Jewish identity for the new Gentile believers and the charybdis of Roman imperial propaganda. These two infamous sea monsters, right? They almost sank Odysseus and his crew. And so, too, Paul knows that the church cannot use the typical emblems of Judaism, circumcision, food laws, and Sabbath, as the primary evidence for daily piety and holy living. And Paul recognizes this sweet seduction of Roman imperial propaganda, which said that Caesar can make the world a better place, and which promoted might makes right. Similar dangers face the American church as it navigates between what we call a rock and a hard place. We can get shipwrecked on the rock of legalistic practices that only cheapen God's grace. And we can run, around, we can run aground on a nationalism that ignores our need of the global church's witness, for we are all together awaiting a savior and his coming. Paul's directive in avoiding both dangers depends on knowing Christ, Christ's resurrection power and his sufferings. These together, resurrection power and suffering, they create the antidote to wrong-headed behaviors and they point the way to holy living until the Lord returns. So now let's turn to examine circumcision and its Jewish backdrop in Paul's argument that we, are the circumcision. And so we'll look first at circumcision and our identity in Christ, specifically looking at circumcision in the Old Testament and Second Temple Judaism. The practice of circumcision in the Bible goes back almost to the beginning of the story, there in Genesis 17. Paul establishes the right of circumcision as representing the covenant God made with Abraham and his descendants. And God commanded that the Israelites circumcise their eight-day-old sons. Several stories in the Bible indicate how important this right is to God. So for example, in Exodus 4, verses 24 through 26, we find Moses and his family moving back to Egypt so that Moses can gather the people and head, uh, lead them out of slavery. Yet, seemingly out of nowhere, God, uh, the Lord, is at the point of killing Moses. And then his wife, Zipporah, steps in with a bit of flint and she circumcises her young son and then places the bloody foreskin on Moses' feet as a way perhaps to atone for the sin of neglecting uh, the rite of circumcision. The text doesn't tell us why Zipporah knew to take that action. But I suspect that she was just simply a good Girl Scout and was prepared for any eventuality. A second example comes from the book of Joshua. In chapter 5, the Israelites have entered the land and God requires that all men be circumcised because during the 40 years in the wilderness, they had not um, performed that rite. Well, they obeyed this order and also God's command to celebrate Passover. The place where they did this is Gilgal, which many think is located very close to Jericho. Now recall that the Israelite army is prepared uh, to do battle against this fortified city, and yet God requires all the soldiers to be circumcised. I think this cartoon conveys a possible conversation. Can you see that, maybe? Okay, Joshua, I've assembled all the men of Israel like you said. Now what? Uh, why are you holding that funny-looking knife? And I wonder if the troops on the wall of Jericho, looking through their binoculars at what's going on in the Israelite camp, one guy turned to another and say, do you see what they're doing? No, oh, they, they, they can't be doing that. It's just a trick. Anyway, the takeaway from these stories, because I don't think it's a brilliant uh, military move to undergo circumcision right before you're heading out to battle. Just my thought. But I'm a biblical studies person, not not a military person. Anyway, the takeaway from all these stories of Israel's early history is that God takes circumcision very seriously. 
The concern for circumcision continues into the Second Temple period. This period after Ezra and Nehemiah, the Jews have come back from Babylon to Jerusalem and Ezra and Nehemiah have uh, rebuilt the temple. This is a period when Greek culture and language sweeps through the Eastern Mediterranean with um, Alexander the Great's conquests. The Jews in Alexandria, Egypt, translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek. We know that as the Septuagint, and it is used extensively. The Greek translation of the Jewish Bible is used extensively by the early church. But another very important event happens during this time, which helps explain why circumcision was so important in the New Testament period. In about 168 BC, a Hellenistic king named Antiochus IV Epiphanes from the Seleucid Empire, what is um, Turkey, parts of Turkey today, parts of Syria, he insisted that Jews in Judea, and especially in Jerusalem, give up their ancestral customs, the law of Moses, and adapt Hellenistic patterns of life. The king took over the temple and built an altar there to pagan gods. He demanded that Jews partake of the festival of Dionysus and that they walk through the, um, uh, the streets in a, in a procession uh, with wreaths of ivy on their head. He ordered that the leading Jewish males pledge loyalty to him by eating a bit of pork. He insisted that Jews refrain from circumcision and Sabbath. Antiochus, in other words, pointed to three key aspects of Jewish law, circumcision, the food laws, and Sabbath, and said they must give them up for the sake of the kingdom. It was too much to ask for most Jews, and so in 167, a town leader named Mattathias, from the Hasmonean family, led a guerrilla, a guerrilla campaign against the Seleucid overlord. This movement was successful, in driving out the Gentiles, and uh, at least from the temple. And we know this festival as Hanukkah, 164, uh, 164 BC. We still celebrate it today. But one of the horrors that was uh, perpetrated by Antiochus IV that tipped the scales uh, towards violent revolt was the martyrdom of two mothers and their baby sons. We learn about this in 2 Maccabees, which is a book of the Apocrypha, that is the additional books in the Catholic uh, Old Testament. In chapter six, we learn that there were two mothers who circumcised their eight-day-old baby boys. When that was discovered, the babies were hung about their mother's neck, and then the mothers were paraded through the Jerusalem streets and then thrown off the city walls to their death. It was a gruesome display meant to terrorize the population and it targeted the Jewish rite of circumcision. Jews saw in this rite a central piece of their identity and Gentiles likewise saw this rite functioning as a defining characteristic of the Jewish people. Thus during the second temple period, Jews could speak Greek, they could use Greek coins, they could uh, use building styles identified as Greek, but they drew the line at giving up circumcision for this rite, along with Sabbath and food laws, established their identity as God's people, both in their eyes and also in the Gentiles' mind. Even those Jews who seemed to embrace much of the Greek philosophy and culture nevertheless clung to physical circumcision as a non-negotiable uh, in, incumbent upon all Jews. So Philo of Alexandria, a prolific Jewish author who lived about the same time as Jesus, he includes some interesting discussions about circumcision. He knows a few Jews who argue that circumcision is only a spiritual one of the heart. And Philo, he disagrees strongly with their conclusion, but he does agree that circumcision's real value is its spiritual focus on the Jew's heart. So after listing practical reasons for circumcision, such as cleanliness and prevention of disease, he next speaks about circumcision of the heart, a phrase that uh, we find throughout the Bible, including Deuteronomy 10, 16. And here Philo notes that as the heart generates thought, so likewise the penis generates physical life. 
Therefore, so as not to become prideful and imagine that he can generate life in himself, a man's penis must be circumcised. Additionally, circumcision represents the moral requirement to refrain from frivolous pleasures. The physical act of circumcision is actually a way to counter the immorality of the flesh, for the physical cut aligns with the spiritual cutting away of vain and idolatrous thoughts. We see, therefore, that Paul's discussion about circumcision is part of a wider conversation that Jews are having at this time. And we can appreciate how Paul's conclusions and, and his uh, ideas are in some way similar to what the Jews are saying at this time, but in other ways, of course, very different. In terms of similarities, um, Jews would have supported Paul's insistence on the spiritual nature and effect of circumcision. They likely would have applauded Paul's decision to circumcise Timothy. Timothy's father was a Gentile, and so Timmy was not circumcised as an infant, uh, but his mother was Jewish. Paul's rather enigmatic phrase um, might suggest that the synagogue community, his enigmatic phrase in um, Acts, might have suggested that the Jewish community viewed Timothy as an uncircumcised Jew, a situation that would need to be remedied as soon as he became an adult and his uh, father had passed away. But here's the rub. Jews in Paul's day could not embrace Paul's insistence that the truly holy people of God, the, the true Israel, that that community could have been made up of Jews and also uncircumcised men, i.e. Gentiles. Gentiles could not be full members of God's holy community. It's interesting, the interpretation, uh, the history of interpretation concerning why Paul circumcised Timothy is interesting and it's relevant to our overall discussion tonight. Talk to you just a little bit about Jerome and Augustine. They exchanged letters concerning Paul's circumcision of Timothy in relation to their own interpretation of Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 14. In this passage, uh, Peter is described as withdrawing from eating with Gentile believers after Jewish believers from Jerusalem come to Antioch and persuade him uh, against his earlier practice. Now, Jerome thinks that Peter simulated adherence to the law so that the Jewish believers would remain in the church. And Paul feigned a rebuke of Peter so that Gentiles would stay in the church. Paul himself, Jerome maintains, only circumcised Timothy out of expediency to keep peace with Jews in the area. Now, Jerome is pulled in this direction because he holds that the law is not only fulfilled in Christ, but it is now dead. And as such, it is lethal for anyone to do the law. It is as bad as being a pagan. But Augustine responds, Paul indeed was indeed a Jew. And when he had become a Christian, he had not abandoned those Jewish sacraments which that people had received in the right way and for a certain appointed time. Therefore, even though he was an apostle of Christ, he took part in observing these, but with this view, that he might show that they were in no wise hurtful to those who, even after they believed in Christ, desired to retain the ceremonies which by the law they had received and learned uh, from their fathers, provided only that they did not build on these their hope of salvation, since the salvation which was foreshadowed in these has now been brought in by the Lord Jesus. He continues, for the same reason he judged that these ceremonies should by no means be made uh, be made binding on Gentile converts because by imposing a heavy and superfluous burden they might turn aside from the faith those who are unaccustomed to them. Now, Jerome responds to Augustine with a significant question. For if they, 
as the Jewish laws, if they did not contribute to salvation, then why were they observed? Jerome's question, I think, can be answered by looking at the value of history in matters of salvation. Paul notes in Romans 9, verses 4 and 5, for example, that there is great advantage that belongs to the Jew, namely, the adoption, the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises, the patriarchs, and by the flesh, the Messiah. Thus, we might answer Jerome that Paul believed that circumcision, for example, testifies to the history of God's people and his promises now fulfilled. Such a testimony is natural for Jews who need not give up their Jewish heritage to follow Christ any more than a Gentile needs to give up his or her mother tongue or um, customary ethnic uh, diet. Said another way, both Jews and Gentiles have culture, have heritage, and have ethnic, uh, ethnicity. The gospel condemns Gentiles' idolatry, and it restricts aspects of the Jews' Torah ob obedience to an ethnic expression. The, Jew, uh, the, the church establishes baptism and Eucharist as rites that bind together Jew and Gentile in Christ. I say a little bit more about this in a book that will be coming out, The Apostle Paul and the Christian Life. Um, we'll say here, uh, Augustine will explain a little bit further to Jerome that the law in Paul's time was what he calls indifferent. That is, it was of no negative consequence for Jews to do the law in the apostolic period. So Paul does not treat the law with contempt, for it came from God. Now, how does all this play out in Philippians 3? Let's walk through that passage. At the beginning of uh, chapter 3, verses uh, 2 and 3, Paul explains that Gentile believers in the Messiah Jesus need not undergo the physical rite of circumcision to take advantage of the community benefits granted to members of God's family. The argument in 2 and 3, verses 2 and 3, revolves around an interesting wordplay. Paul labels the supposing group the mutilation, katatome, which in Greek sounds like circumcision, paratome. So Paul argues here with his play on words that Gentiles can also be members of God's family because they are in Christ. I suggest that Paul is not contrasting Christianity and Judaism here. Rather, he is distinguishing two ways of living one's faith, living in Christ. To Paul's opponents, proper Christian lifestyle includes the ethnic Jewish markers of circumcision, food laws, and Sabbath rest. And they maintain that the Messiah Jesus would want Gentile believers to be pure and clean, to eat kosher food, and to rest on the Sabbath, and be circumcised. Paul made his case against such position in most all of his churches. You can look at Galatians 2, Colossians 4, uh, Ephesians 2, Titus 1. Paul speaks to those who imagine the Messiah community to be one that continues certain Torah practices. Luke tells us about such a group in Acts 15. Luke talks about how, quote, certain individuals came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, when Paul and Barnabas reached Jerusalem and they talked to the other apostles and elders, Luke tells us some of the believers who belonged to the, circum to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and be required to keep the law of Moses. Now, notice all the people who are talking here are believers. The question is not one of getting in because they all are holding that God's Messiah is Jesus. Jesus has come. He has died for their sins. He's raised and he will return. The debate centers on what this new community of believers will look like. In a sense, what is 
holiness. The Jerusalem Council debated the issue, and they concluded that Gentiles did not need to be circumcised, but they go on to say these Gentiles should abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. The food requirements given by the council focused on avoiding idolatry and the pagan festivals that went along with it. Now, the genius of their decision was that it allowed Gentile believers to continue their practices without mandating them for Gentile believers. Therefore, Paul does not ask Jewish believers to work on the Sabbath, not to, in, uh, to eat a barbecue pork sandwich. Instead, he declares that one group need not change to become like another group, and moreover, no group can establish their ethnic practices as the standard for holiness. Well, as we continue in this passage, we see that Paul identifies several characteristics about himself before he was called as an apostle. And he is continuing his discussion over against the position of the mutilation. So notice how he describes himself. He is circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He notes that he's a Hebrew, that he's a Pharisee, that he's a zealous persecutor of the church, and that he is a blameless doer of the law. Now, the first three are accidents of birth, but the last four mark out Paul's choice in expressing his birthright. Paul's claim to be a Hebrew of Hebrews may be a way of saying, I'm very committed to my Jewish heritage. And it may also be a reference to his knowledge of the language of Hebrew. Paul indicates that he has zeal, and it's evidenced by his persecution of the church. Now, in Paul's time, zeal carried ethnic overtones, uh, patriotic overtones, all in support of God's law. Paul talks about persecuting the church in 1 Corinthians 15 and also in Galatians 1. We look at Galatians 1, especially verses 13 and 15. We see Paul's autobiographical sketch there, and we find he uses um, a rare word. The word is Judaism. It sounds common to us, but it's rare in the New Testament. That term carried patriotic expressions, nationalistic expressions or uh, connotations in Paul's time. Remember the mothers who circumcised their sons and then were killed by Antiochus? That's the zeal that Paul is talking about. It's a concern to guard against compromise and false teachings. Paul's actions at Stephen's death fit the pattern um, that he presents to the Philippians when he identifies himself as zealous. I am so zealous for the law, Paul says, that I am willing to put to death a fellow Jew. But then Jesus grabs hold of Paul, gives him new life, and gives him an assignment. I want you to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And so in Chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, Paul draws a contrast with his life as a Pharisee and his life as an apostle of Christ to the Gentiles. There's some key points we have to remember as we interpret this passage. First, Paul remains Jewish throughout his whole life. When Christ called him on the Damascus Road, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He didn't ask Paul to stop being Jewish. Instead, he called Paul to follow him, to take up the mantle of apostle. And then second, these verses are not describing how someone gets saved. For Paul, when Paul says, I want to know Christ, he's already saved. Right? He's, God has already, he's already accepted the forgiveness of, extended by God's magnificent grace through Christ. In these verses, Paul lays out a vision, a, a breathtaking vision of devotion, of a way to know Christ. And he draws a compelling portrait of Christ, whose name or pronoun occurs almost as frequently as Paul's does in this section. 
What I find so amazing about this, and I think the Philippians would have found so amazing, is that Paul says Christ is knowable. I want to know Christ. That is not something that pagans could declare with any certainty about their gods. You know, Christ is the treasure for which one sells all. Christ is the pearl of great price. Christ opens himself to a relationship with believers through his faithfulness and our response, faith. When we read this alongside the hymn in Philippians chapter 2, it provides a, a stunning picture of the Son of God who, becoming incarnate, was serving, was suffering, was dying, rose and now reigns. And Paul wants to know this one. Those who embrace the invitation are changed forever. And Paul will go on to describe this change in the following verses. The beginning here in verse 7, Paul will use language of accounting, gain and loss, that accounting terms in, in Paul's time. What was once of supreme value to Paul, his identity as a Pharisee, his zeal, his Jewish heritage, it is reevaluated now based on different criteria. If you want to know Christ, says Paul, then your coins of Jewish ancestry and the Jewish practices, they are of no value. Indeed, keeping those coins in your purse could actually be detrimental in gaining Christ. Why? Because of Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrected life condemned this present age as at best limited and at worst evil. Ethnic claims, education assets, economic, social, political advantages, they are all virtues based on earthly standards. But next to Christ, all these legitimate advantages grow dim, and they can become toxic, germ-carrying, rotten trash if they are held as first importance alongside knowing Christ. But if believers hold them as of second importance and instead focus on the final resurrection, then this believer is able to embrace a lifelong deepening relationship with Christ. I'd like you to keep in mind Paul's emphasis on Christ as we get into these high weeds of theology. This passage contains key theological concepts including righteousness, law, and faith. Now, historically, Paul, since in Reformation times, has, um, has been thought to teach that Jews sought salvation through human works by doing the law to earn salvation. This is called the anthropological view. But since the Holocaust and the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, Christian scholarship has reevaluated this position. They have reread the Jewish writings of the Second Temple period and they have poured over the sectarian Dead Sea Scroll material. And scholars have also exposed underlying anti-Semitic beliefs that were supported, even justified, uh, in the name of Christ. Now, many of these scholars conclude that Jews in Paul's day did not do the law to get saved, but they did the law out of obedience to God's election of them as God's people. I was in graduate school in the late 1980s when these ideas were just forming. There was no label for the movement yet, but key thinkers like Krister Stendhal and E.P. Sanders were suggesting that Jews were not burdened under the law or trying to earn points for their salvation. Instead, Jews obeyed the Torah because they were already God's people. And the uh, the results of these ideas eventually coalesced um, under the label, the new perspective on Paul. It's also, though, a new perspective on Second Temple Judaism, but it's known as the new perspective on Paul. And therefore, when Paul speaks of, in chapter 3, verse 9, when Paul speaks of a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, according to the new perspective on Paul, he is not expecting, uh, explaining here that he tried to earn his salvation. Rather, he was following the Torah in light of his identity as a Jew. This righteousness 
is expressed in the exclusivist attitude. The law was understood to represent and uphold Israel's privilege, even to the extent that God's righteousness maybe was only for Israel. So when Paul says my here, he's not stressing his human effort or merit, but rather he's emphasizing his obedience to the law. This term righteousness or righteous is used elsewhere in the New Testament. For example, Luke describes Elizabeth and Zechariah as righteous before God, as walking in God's ways and following his commandments. This is in chapter one of uh, Luke's gospel. And this draws on Old Testament understandings. For example, in 1 Samuel 24, David is declared as more righteous than King Saul because David did not act violently against the king when he had the chance. And in another case, Tamar the widow is determined to be righteous in contrast with her father-in-law, Judah, for she upheld her obligations while Judah reneged on his promises. This is in Genesis 38. And the Dead Sea Scrolls include this testimony, and I quote, As for me, if I stumble, the mercies of God shall be my eternal salvation. If I stagger because of the sin of the flesh, my justification will be by the righteousness of God, which endures forever. He will draw me near by his grace, and by his mercy will he bring my justification through his righteousness, he will cleanse me of all the uncleanness of man and of all the sins of the children of men. And when Paul says that now his righteousness is from God, he speaks to the divine power through Christ's death and resurrection that has the power to change human life and to make new each and every believer. Paul draws a contrast here between his obedience and faithfulness um, to, it, it, that leads to a sense of righteousness in following the law and Christ's obedience or faithfulness that overcame the power of sin and fulfilled the law. See, Paul draws a contrast here between himself and Christ, not so much between two activities that Paul does, right? He's not contrasting, Paul's not contrasting two of his own activities, that is, blameless law-keeping and then having faith. Paul doesn't say here in uh, verse 9 that he used to try and earn his salvation, but that now he just believes. The, the point is that in his earlier life was guided by the law, but it gave no access to resurrection power, the resurrection life that he now enjoys in Christ. So the new perspective position believes that Jews in Paul's day held that they were members of God's family by birth and that they took up obedience to the law in grateful response to God's calling Jews. Um, they didn't do the law to get saved. The law was to guide their lives of faithful service and worship. Jews who failed to follow the law might be considered apostate, right? They're no longer members of God's people. I'll give you an analogy. When I was young, say eight or 10, I did something wrong. One of the very, very few times in my basically perfect childhood. And my grandmother corrected me. She said to me, honey, Harrisons don't do that. My maiden name is Harrison. Do you see what she was doing? She was telling me that as a Harrison, there are certain expectations. I do these things and I avoid other things because I'm a Harrison. I don't become a Harrison by doing these things. I was born a Harrison, and thus I am under obligation to act as a Harrison. There's my grandma. I'm wearing her wedding dress. I got married to that fellow that's sitting out there. It was a good decision. Notice that in both cases, the Jews and the, Has and the Harrisons have expectations for community behavior. It's not enough to have a label Jew or Harrison. One needed to act accordingly. God made a people holy to himself. God called Abraham to be holy and be a witness to God's holiness to a watching world. 
And Paul believed that the body of Christ should also be holy. And that's why Paul will be speaking all, in all of his epistles about walking or living in holiness. Everyone in the first century, Jew, Gentile, of, of any stripe, believed that community membership meant a way of life. It was not enough to say you were a Stoic, an Epicurean, a devotee of Isis, a Jew. You must live under the guidelines of your community. Now Paul goes on to explain faith. He explains that it is by faith that one comes to God. Twice in, this past, in uh, verse 9, Paul speaks of faith. He speaks of a righteousness that is, and there you see in the Greek, dia pisteos Christo. This phrase can be rendered either as through faith in Christ or through the faithfulness of Christ. The ambiguity centers on whether Christ is the subject or the object of the noun faith. Of course, both meanings are true theologically. The question is, what is Paul accenting here? To answer this, we can turn to the second occurrence of faith. And there you see it can be by or on the basis of or depending on faith, right? If this phrase refers to the believer's response of faith, then it could mean that that top uh, phrase on your slide there, that phrase points to Christ's faithfulness. And it may also be that that second phrase, by faith, actually links with verse 10, that next verse. And then Paul would be stressing that he knows Christ by faith and declares that the power of the resurrection and participation in Christ's sufferings are likewise lived out by faith. In fact, I'm not sure that we need to make a hard distinction among these various options, for Paul may be deliberately broad here, reinforcing the idea that all life in God, the knowing, the doing, the gaining, the suffering, all is through faith. Well, so far we have looked at Paul's personal story, and by extension, of course, every believer's proper mindset, wanting to know the power of Christ's resurrection and fellowship with his sufferings. These desires have a goal, the transformation of our lowly bodies to a glorious resurrection body. And this end is enjoyed in part now through our citizenship, which is in heaven from which we await our Savior. Now, you might not hear the political language in these verses at the end of chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, but the Philippians certainly did. The opening sentence here in Philippians, the opening sentence in uh, verse 20 includes a noun that we don't find anywhere else in the New Testament. Testament. It's polytuma. It's in bold on, your, on the screen here as citizenship. The term is used in wider Greek circles to indicate a commonwealth. It has the idea of an ethnic group living abroad in a foreign city. It carries the sense of being an active body that regulates its constituents, an association that oversees its people. Both Jews and Greeks used it to describe the body politic in, in a Greek city. Importantly, it also carries the sense of exile or colony, a group whose main social body live in a distant homeland. Paul seems to use this term to describe the Philippian church for two reasons. First, it stresses their unity as a group set apart from other groups within the polis. That is, they have a unique identity relative to the other groups in their town. And then second, I think it tweaks the term's general meaning in, that would have carried in Philippi. The general meaning would be to stress the city's status as a colony of Rome. As such, being a colony of Rome, Philippi held the highest status of any city outside of Italian soil. And it was justifiably proud of that honor. Paul transposes such honor to the heavenly kingdom above. So we could say, even as Rome exists currently, Paul stresses the Philippian church's commonwealth also exists in heaven. 
and it is more real than those seven hills guarding the eternal city, Rome. Paul uses the present tense uh, in his verbs here when he speaks of our citizenship being in heaven. In other words, this heavenly home exists now. Paul says as much to the Ephesians, right, that Christ is seated at the hand of the Father now and that we as believers are seated with him. Moreover, this heavenly home is not just a future example of, of like what we have right now, but it's a totally different nature. In this new place, love rules, sin is banished, joy abounds, and believers today, they actually have an address in this place. We are not ultimately defined by our earthly situations and circumstances. So the medical diagnosis, or the shattered dreams, the broken relationships, the list of regrets, they don't fully and finally define where we live or who we are. To the Philippians, Paul says, they are an ethnic group currently living in exile, awaiting a homecoming. Paul explains that from this exalted place in heaven, the Lord Jesus, our Savior, will come. Now, in Paul's time, townspeople would pour out of the city walls and line the main street into the city to honor the victorious general. For example, uh, Josephus, who is a late first century Jewish historian, he describes in great detail Vespasian's welcome to Rome as the benefactor and the savior. Everyone, men, women, and children, left the city and lined the main street to get a glimpse of the triumphal new emperor coming into the city. So too, the people of the city of Antioch lined the main road into their city. It stretched for almost four miles to welcome the general Titus, who is Vespasian's son, fresh from his victory over Jerusalem in 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple destroyed. Yeah, everyone wanted to celebrate with the victorious army. Well, by happy chance, one year I happened to be in London for the Queen's speech. This is an event where the Queen ceremoniously opens Parliament. The roads were blocked to make way for the horse-drawn carriage with HRH inside, waving and smiling. And then after a brief ceremony in the Parliament building, back she went. Of course, I waited the whole time just to watch the, the whole procession. The ex example of waiting and watching as a head of state uh, rolls by, you know, that hardly compares to the greatness of Christ's return. It, it's going to be even better than the celebration that happened in Chicago when the Blackhawks won the Stanley Cup. This example of waiting and watching we kind of know it, but can you imagine when Christ returns, he will be welcomed by the entire body of believers worldwide. It will be a great event. You know, in the neighborhood parades, those on parade might sign autographs, shake hands, kiss babies. But in Philippians 3.21, Paul says that believers have something far more life-changing that awaits them. Paul uses three key terms that are pivotal in his argument here as he describes what will happen when our Lord returns. Soter, schema, and morphe. I'm using the Greek terms here because sometimes at least the last two terms are translated with different English terms depending on the, the context. So first, looking at Savior, Soter. Paul indicates that when Jesus the Savior returns, he will transform a believer's body, this body of humiliation, such that it will share in the likeness of the body of glory that is Christ's. Two points bear mention here. First, Christ is identified as Savior. That's actually a very rare way to talk about Jesus in the Gospels. It happens in Ephesians 5, 2 Timothy 1, Titus 1 and 2, and then also John 4, where the Samaritan village 
um, identifies Jesus as the savior of the world. So it's not a very, even though we use it all the time, it's not a very common term in the New Testament. I wonder if Paul chooses it here because it was also used to venerate Caesar. There's an important inscription uh, from a town near uh, the current uh, city of Izmir or ancient Smyrna there in Turkey. And in this um, inscription, the calendar, the yearly calendar is recalibrated based on Augustus's, that is Caesar Augustus's birthday. And in this inscription, Caesar is called Savior. Plus, we know in Philippi, only a few decades uh, earlier than Paul, um, Octavian Augustus and Mark Antony, they defeat Cassius and Brutus. You know, Cassius and Brutus are the um, ringleaders of the group that assassinated Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar is the adopted father of Octavian uh, Augustus, who is pictured here in the statue. You see the little figure kind of hanging off the, the bottom of the cloak. That is um, a representation of Cupid who is connected with Venus, who is the patron goddess of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was declared a god by the Roman Senate shortly after he was assassinated. Octavian is the son of this god, so Caesar, this figure, can identify himself as Divi Filius, son of God. And this statue promotes that. That's his PR there. Yeah. Well, these men, Mark Antony and Octavian, were certainly, they would parade through this region and promote their victory. But I think, as Paul uses this term for Jesus, that there is a note of irony here. Octavian's feet are of clay. And even his subsequent apotheosis, when Augustus dies and he is declared a god, that no one is saying he's going to return and become victorious over all forces of evil in the world. So I wonder if Paul is subtly mocking here the minuscule, in comparison, minuscule expectations of Augustus' savior in comparison to the ultimate power and goodness of Christ, our Savior. And then I also wonder if Paul has used Savior here deliberately because there are enemies of the cross that Paul mentions in verse 18 of chapter 3, and those enemies of the cross despise Christ's suffering, and they also had no true sense then of Jesus as Savior. Now, most people in Philippi, just like most people everywhere, they want safety and they want security, and they usually rely on military might to achieve that. When they find a man who can deliver, they identify him as Savior. But Christ the Savior has a much more radical view of the world's problems and a much more invasive solution. The problem is sin through and through, and the solution is a new heavens and a new earth, complete with the believer's new transformed bodies. So we look at the two other key terms and we'll look at their meaning as it relates to the hymn in chapter two. We look at the Christ-likeness there. In that hymn, Christ is both in the form of God, that would be Morphe, and also he is in the form, Morphe, of a slave. Paul explains that the nature or the character of God was to not take advantage of status, privilege, or position. Christ did not consider his equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Further in the hymn, you can see we find that Christ died on the cross. Now. Ancient ears would not be surprised to know that a slave was crucified, because that was a common fate for slaves who uh, went foul of the law. So this thread then that I want to trace here through the term morphe, this form, form of God, form of slave, Paul is stressing here 
uh, at least in part, the supreme social shame endured and embraced by Jesus on our behalf. It is this aspect of his death that Paul says he wants to know. Paul says, I want to become like him in his death, verse 11 of chapter 3. Paul desires for himself and for the Philippian Christians he wants them to forego the path of earthly social honor and instead embrace service for others. To become like Christ in his death is to become a servant of all. And Paul will also pick up then this term morphe in 321 when he speaks of believers sharing in the likeness of Christ. And so at the end of chapter 3, as Paul draws on this language from the Christ hymn, Paul wants us to remember that hymn as we think about all that will happen in Christ's return. Now, there's another part of the hymn that describes Christ taking up human flesh, right? The incarnation. Christ is in the form, but this is a different this is schema, form of humanity, being found in human form, schema. Christ's human form is both humble, experiencing humiliation, and obedient. And this obedience led to dying on a cross. So too, Paul says, we can participate in Christ's suffering. The hymn uh, will continue, the hymn continues, I don't have it on the screen, but the hymn continues that God highly exalted Christ and gave him the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, um, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The glory is always and only God's. And Christ's victory over sin and death is his alone. Ours is the sure hope of transformation based on that secure victory. Paul indicates that Christ will transform our bodies. He uses the word schema there in chapter 3. Our present bodies will be transchemed. <laughs> our body, which is currently in a state of humility or humiliation, um, will be changed. Paul is not... Uh, decrying our fleshly existence. Rather, he's just noting that our current life in this age is one of affliction. We would be wrong to assume that it was all about us. This transformation of the saints to the conformity and the glory of Christ's body is but a piece of Christ's full and final victory over all powers, putting all things in subjection to him. Christ came to save sinners, he came to give us life abundant, but he also came to right the destruction that is plaguing creation. So it's not enough to save human souls. He must vanquish death once for all, subjecting all powers, all of creation under his just and loving hand. Paul will write the same sort of thing to the Corinthians. We find it in chapter 15. That God has the final word, and that word is victory. Victory over sin, over evil and over death. The circumcision party of Paul's brother was a huge success. The boy joined the community of adults. I assume, although I'm not sure, Paul, who's now a grown man and a father of his own, of his own children, his own sons, maybe one day they will undergo the rite of circumcision. But this circumcision, as Paul well knows, Paul Jeroge, he knows, that's made by human hands on the flesh. That will never replace the figural circumcision, those marks made by God's hands on each one of us, each one of his children. The Apostle Paul claims that through participation in Christ's suffering and with the power that raised Christ from the dead, believers today may live a holy life. We're guided by the Holy Spirit. We know Christ. And thus we know that our sins are forgiven. Our life today then is marked by participation in Christ's sufferings. As we strain our eyes to the horizon, hoping even now to catch the first glimpse of our returning Savior who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. That we may live in our resurrected bodies in this new heavens and the new earth. And I believe that's why Paul can say, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice.
Thank you.